Hey everyone, Cassius here, welcoming you back to the Shakespeare Minute. As you probably know, I inaugurated this site with a list of Shakespeare's top moms, and then for Father's Day, I did a list of Shakespeare's top dads, noting that while families are of course interesting units in Shakespeare's plays, they tend to have a lot of problems, and I'm pretty happy that my family isn't out of Shakespeare. Well, when it comes to relatives being absolutely terrible to each other in Shakespeare, nobody takes the cake quite like brothers. So I've decided to do a two-part series. Today, the best. On Monday, the worst of Shakespeare's brothers. brothers who are, in fact, not terrible to each other. Number five on the list is the duo of Guiderius and Arviragus, aka Polydor and Cadwall, from Cymbeline. These two boys are the lost princes of the kingdom. They were stolen when they were infants, and they were raised under the assumed names Polydor and Cadwall by Belarius, who now goes by Morgan. They are raised in the woods to be these lovely, awesome, pastoral people. Of course, they have this inner nobility that makes them long for something more. They want to go to the court, they want to go into the city and fulfill a destiny that they don't even know is theirs. What's interesting about Guiderius and Arviragus is that they seem to love each other, they seem to love their father, and when they meet their sister, who's in disguise at the time as a boy, they treat her like their brother, and they are generally the mold of fraternal love in this play. So for that, they take spot number five on the list of top brothers. Boys, bid him welcome. I love him as my brother, and such a welcome as I'd give to him after long absence, such is yours, most welcome. The night to the owl and the morn to the lark, less welcome. Brother number four is Orlando from As You Like It, another pastoral comedy play. Now, Orlando is the youngest son of the now-deceased knight Roland de Bois, and as the youngest, he kind of got the raw deal. His oldest brother, Oliver, is kind of horrible to him, and actually at one point tries to kill him. Uh, he really does not like Orlando, and Orlando doesn't understand what he should do. Uh, he ends up running away so that he isn't killed. So what does Orlando do to merit a spot on this list? Well, when he's out in the woods running away, his brother, who's been sent after him by the crazy, awesomely terrible Duke, uh, is sleeping under a tree, and Orlando sees his brother. This is the guy who tried to kill him a few times before this, and when he sees his brother's life in danger, instead of just letting his brother die in his sleep, he well, he steps in, and we hear about it from the older brother Oliver himself, who is so grateful for this rescue that he has a complete change of heart. So not only does Orlando save his brother Oliver's life, he also gets Oliver back to the land of the good, relatively sane people. It's a pretty wacky play. And I know that Oliver, of course, isn't the only brother in the play to have a crazy 180 degree shift in his personality, but this one really seems to be driven by his brother's actions, which is why Orlando is brother number four. Brother number three is Don Pedro from Much Ado About Nothing. Don Pedro is the prince in the play. He comes in, he's just won a war against who? His brother, Don John the Bastard. Who, uh, well, yeah, he is kind of a bastard. The point is that he's defeated his brother in battle. He has every right to throw his brother in jail, to kill him, but he doesn't. He brings his brother in and tries to make him part of his court, part of his life. Now, you could say that that's a power play, and it probably is, but the fact is he could be doing far worse. Don John, of course, doesn't appreciate this kindness, as he explains early on in the play. You have of late stood out against your brother, and he hath taken you newly into his grace. But it is impossible you should take true root, but by the fair weather that you make yourself. I had rather be a canker in a hedge 
and arose in his grace. However, I think because Don Pedro doesn't crack the whip when he damn well has the right to, this makes him a pretty darn good brother and number three on my list. Brother number two is Laertes from Hamlet. Now I know that Laertes is, well, you could interpret his character any number of ways, and there are certainly people who come down on the side that he is a terrible brother, he is horrible to Ophelia, and we should not uh, appreciate his relationship with her. Now, I think that that's not quite right. From where I sit, he comes back home, and he might not understand what's going on, but then again, he hasn't been in on much of what's been happening. So if he doesn't understand what's going on, that's not his fault. And what he does is try to avenge his family. Uh, he's avenging his father's death. He's avenging his sister's madness. He might not be able to intellectually fight with Hamlet, but he's there to kill the man responsible for harming his family. And I think that for that, his familial devotion definitely needs to be appreciated, even if he can't quite uh, understand Ophelia's life and what she's truly dealing with and everything that's going on in Elsinore. He is trying very hard. His heart is absolutely in the right place from where I'm sitting reading this text. So for that and for all of his intense effort in this plan, he is literally willing to die for it. He gets the spot as brother number two. <laughs> by heaven, thy madness shall be paid by weight till <laughs> our scale turns the beam. And brother number one, Lucius from Titus Andronicus, uh, with a slight honorable mention here for Mutius, who doesn't stick around long enough to really earn number one spot, but you know, they are brothers and it's the same situation, so I'm going to put him in here as well. So what do Lucius and Mutius do in Titus Andronicus? Well, uh, so spoilers are going to happen here, by the way, in a big way, just in case you haven't read Titus. Uh, Mutius dies in the first scene of the play. This kicks off the action. He and Lucius and their other two middle brothers, uh, they defend their sister's right to marry the man she was engaged to, that is Bassianus, the younger brother of Saturninus, the emperor. Now their father, Titus, as well as the emperor, want Lavinia, their sister, to marry Saturninus, the emperor. And Lavinia does not want to do this. She was engaged to the younger brother, and even if Saturninus is the emperor, he doesn't have the right to do this. So the brothers take arms against their own father, whose devotion to the emperor makes him fight on the other side. And for this loyalty to their sister, they certainly uh, gain a lot of points already. Mutius dies in this fight. His father, Titus, actually strikes him down and kills him. So they are willing to fight to the death to preserve their sister's integrity and honor. And after this, unfortunately, Mutius doesn't get to continue doing very much Lucius ends up doing so much more. When his sister's husband, Bassianus, who she does end up marrying, uh, is killed by the sons of Tamara, the goth queen who is now the Roman empress, uh, his brothers, the two middle brothers, are wrongly accused of this crime. And he actually goes to the legal bodies to try and save them, and of course he is banished for this. He is willing to fight for them, he's banished because he tries to go to bat for his brothers. He also, uh, earlier on, takes the side of his dead brother Mutius when Titus says, I can't bury him, he was fighting me, he is not my son, he is not a loyal son to me, I can't bury him in the sacred monument. Lucius takes the side of his brother saying, he is an honorable man and you have to let him in to the monument. So Lucius fights a lot for his brothers. He also comes back at the end of the play with an army of Goths to try and fight Rome, uh, very much in part to save his sister. He's there, he sees what happened to her. She was raped and horribly mutilated and disfigured. He wants to avenge her, as well as the rest of his family, of course. So that is Lucius, who goes through so much, all to save his siblings, to honor his siblings, and ends up taking over at the end because he is just the most awesome guy in this play, and he just goes through so much and manages to actually uh, execute on a fair bit of it. So he's an exciting character and brother number one in Shakespeare.
But wherefore stands there with thy weapon drawn? To rescue my two brothers from their death, which attempt, judges have pronounced my everlasting doom of banishment. <laughs> of course, Shakespeare's brothers are mostly terrible to each other. Of course, uh, brothers tend to not be as terrible to their sisters, but we will see the worst brothers list coming up. Not entirely brother-on-brother -brother terribleness. We'll check that out later, coming up on the next episode on Monday. Till then, I'm Cassius. Think of the world.